everybody. Welcome to Sketching Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are today. We are talking about Hamlet. Yeah. I'm so excited. Um, I'm just. I love. I love. Love. Love Hamlet. It is one of my all time favorite plays. Um, I think that I've had a lot of new appreciation for Hamlet in the past couple months, even just watching um Akira Kurosawa is a you know filmmaker who does a, lot, a couple of Shakespeare adaptations and watching his Hamlet adaptation I had some like revelations with the protest too much guests that I had on I'm gonna hit those later um but speaking of protest too much today we are also recording a live episode yay uh we're doing a magic bracket so I am going to describe all of the magical powers i guess <laughs> from i picked eight shakespeare characters who have like magical powers uh, that are active in the play like actively okay. magical in the play and i'm going to describe them and you're going to pick a winner and we're going to find the true like best magical power yeah it's gonna be very fun i'm excited <laughs> so yeah um so on how are you today i'm good i'm good today i'm ready to draw I'm, yeah i'm excited yeah i'm feeling it mm-hmm. how are you at skulls with reference pretty good okay how are you with the <laughs> reference of of 450 year old text <laughs> really good i think after 11 episodes really really solid with <laughs> really old great. text great perfect um so today we are doing the most famous image of Hamlet. So when you think of Hamlet, what do you think of? Uh, the guy holding the skull, talking to it. If you had to guess what speech he was saying during that, if you think of Hamlet and the things you know he says, <laughs> or the things like generally people know uh-huh. he says, and feel free to throw this in chat too, chatters. Um, commonly, People associate this staring at a skull with any guesses? Uh, I always think of to be or not to be. Yeah. yeah. So the to be or not to be speech, the arguably most famous speech in all of Shakespeare, maybe? I would say maybe the window scene in Romeo and Juliet. Sure. That I would put them at for for the non-informed. That would mm-hmm. be my big. Those are the ones that I would know that everybody knows. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, But definitely the most famous speech in Hamlet uh, is always in modern art, uh, pop culture, conflated with the skull. Mm -hmm. They are not (laughs) the same scene. Interesting. No, no, dear viewer. Um, To be or not to be comes much earlier in the play. And it's kind of early in Hamlet's journey of like, my dad came back as a ghost and told me to kill my uncle. What is happening? What is <laughs> only, going on? I'm only a little crazy at this point. I'm not full yeah. crazy. Exactly. Um, and then later on, after his uncle has sent him off to be killed, and then he gets like rescued by pirates or whatever the hell, uh, he comes back. He's with his friend slash boyfriend, Horatio. Um, <laughs> and they're, they find themselves in a graveyard. And they're kind of spying. They see a funeral procession come in. Hamlet learns. Oh, actually, this is all after the that speech. Uh, so I'll cut that there. <laughs> um, so this is our one comedic scene in Hamlet. Now, normally, Shakespeare gives us like one. We've got, we did the Porter in Macbeth. Yep. yep. This is Act 5. Wow. Act 5, scene 1. So this is the second to last scene of the play that we get our comedy. Um, there are other opportunities for comedic stuff earlier, of course. Um, well, not of course, it's a tragedy, but <laughs> there are other there are other opportunities for comedy earlier. But um, this is the first like actual comedic. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, hear us us hear us us up. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, y'all. Uh, since. Mike is not here. Uh, you might have to hang out with Hero's barking for a little bit. We've got some <laughs> high activity in our neighborhood today. I'm so sorry. Um, so this is our this is our 
comedic scene. And let's do it that way. We've got two grave diggers come in. And these grave diggers are digging graves. And um, these are like the jokes. Okay. Um, now, where are we? Um, what is he that builds stronger than either the mason, the shipwright, or the carpenter? And the other says, the gallows maker. For that frame outlives a thousand tenants. Grave digger says, I like that I went well in good faith. The gallows does well, but how does it well? It does well to those that do ill. Now thou dost ill to say the gallows is built stronger than the church. Our gall, the gallows may do well to thee. To it again, come. Who builds stronger than a mason, a shipwright, or a carpenter? Aye, tell me that none yoke. He says, cudgel thy brains no more about it, for your dull ass wit, <laughs> your dull ass will not mend his pace with beating. And when you are asked this question next, say a grave maker. The houses he makes last till doomsday. Get the in and fetch me a stoop of liquor. So we've got this like little like riddly thing happening. They talk about the semantics of um, drowning, if it's purposeful or not. And if, you know, who's at fault in that case? If the water comes to you, if you come to the water, whose fault is the drowning? Hmm. Right. Okay. So like just some it's comedy, but it's also like kind of like some head scratchy make you think moments. Yeah. Now, is that do you think it fit for these characters or do you think that was also a tie into things that were happening with Ophelia? Do you think it was a purposeful introduction by Shakespeare into their dialogue? Purposeful because the grave they're digging is for Ophelia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's literally gallows humor. Exactly um so yeah super purpose super purposeful um super slated uh, and then the grape digger starts singing and <laughs> our boy hammy ham ham comes in and he's like had this fellow no feeling of his business he sings in grave making and so then horatio says custom hath made it a property of easiness so if you've done this if this is your job you're going to keep it light. You're going to keep it um, like you're going to find ways to get through your job. Yeah. And get through the day. So then he starts tossing out skulls. He starts making room. He's tossing skulls <laughs> over his shoulder and Hamlet, you know, Hamlet and Horatio are like hiding in a bush. And they're like, what is happening? Um, and this is the speech that this is the speech that um is the skull talking speech so hamlet talks about like hamlet has this kind of uh come to jesus thought <laughs> um about the like these skulls could be literally anyone like this could be a lawyer or a doctor or a madman or a fool like these they everyone returns to bones mm -hmm. and that kind of like realization for him is a little shakes him up a little bit um, and then he takes the skull and he says, let me see. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath bore me on his back a thousand times, and now, and now how aboard my imagination it is. My gorge rises at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed I know not how oft. Where be your jibes now, your gambols, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one now to mock your own grinning? Quite chap fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber and tell her, let her paint an inch thick to this favor. She must come. Make her laugh at that. So this is his. I think to me, this is Shakespeare. Uh, this is Hamlet kind of accepting the circle of life type of idea. He's seen his father's ghost. Um, death hasn't affected him in this way until now and so we see him kind of like have this realization of it someone being someone that he can like hold and mm -hmm. look at um and and kind of like think through like those memories and that childhood innocence and how much he's lost not just in his like coming of age or loss of innocence but like how much he's lost in the past x months of the play losing his father 
tech like losing his mother he doesn't know he's lost ophelia yet but like he's lost a lot and yeah. i think this is his seeing the happiness that he used to have is his realization of that how how old is he supposed to be or oh oh and gosh okay what a good question what a, <laughs> oh dear what a great question <laughs> um uh, i'm so glad you asked because there are people who are who have chats about it so let's see what <laughs> version we have here let's see what Fol what version folger has um so i was kind of thinking in terms of like the scene for today i was kind of thinking this whole like little chunk uh, mm -hmm. like we've done a little bit more like overall movement through scenes um uh, but if you want me to reread any of the parts or like read any of the parts just let me know okay while i look up let me control find King Hamlet. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hamlet asks, how long hast thou been a grave maker? And the grave digger says, of all the days in the year, I came to it the day that our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. How long is that since? Cannot you tell that? Every fool can tell that. It was that very day that young Hamlet was born, he that is mad and sent to England. I marry, why was it blah, blah, blah. And then he says, hmm, this isn't a version that has it. So let me pull up, because there's some versions, like the Cordo versions, that flat out say, um 30 years ago mm -hmm. and some that say like 16 years ago or 18 years ago or something like that um and so people are always like hamlet's 30. i'm like mm, there are some issues with that but yeah we'll get there um i guess to me because this is one of the ones that we did study in school not for me remembering it any better but the actions of hamlet not only always felt like a a very young and privileged person who had not had a lot of exposure to like the outside world and real consequences of things, but also just felt younger. Like they felt mm, more rash, more, more taken by their emotions in a way. Yep. Um, Sorry, I know this is not. Okay, so it is in this one. Right here in Denmark, I've been sexing here, man and boy, 30 years. Now, some people take that as being um, definite uh, that he's been a grave digger here 30 years um, since Hamlet was born. And so some people take that as that. Um, there are other versions that I'll try to... Uh, I'll try to find some other things. But there's another quote where Gertrude at the end um, is like, oh, gosh, Hamlet's so out of shape. He's so old and out of shape. Why is he doing <laughs> this? Why is he fighting? Um, but then also, he's he's in school. Mm. And this is the thing that the, the 30 years old bit doesn't necessarily ring true to me, um, is that he is 30 or he's 30 he's in school he's like a child the way that he deals with and interacts with people and and works through his grief um to me seems quite young yeah it seems quite like a teenager um like ace tiger says he came across as one of those rich stuck up 15 year olds until later in the play it's, i would agree with that he's kind of been so sheltered that he doesn't have any experience of like the real world and yeah. and has the 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 bubble of youth to kind of give him a pass on that to me, at least. I think if he's 30 years old and acting like this, there's a little, I think it's definitely, well, I mean, I have a lot less sympathy for him if that's the case. Uh, just because that, how did you get to that point? Even being sheltered, even being royalty, how did you get there without adapting at all? Right. And not having any communication faculties. And it's the way that he treats Ophelia for me. Yeah. It's the way that he's like, oh, I'm just going to act mad and like all my problems will be solved. It's the, 
Uh, it's the worst part about Shakespeare. Shakespeare has no characters who are effective communicators, but like this, <laughs> Hamlet really takes the cake on that. <laughs> I think he knows because that's where all the drama comes from. It's just people it's won't true. talk to each other. It's true lack of communication. But I think it's interesting too in that, not just because they're the plays that I know the best, but for famous characters that we're talking about, the difference between the way that Hamlet communicates with Ophelia and the way that Romeo com communicates with Juliet. And they both suffer from the same things of, we don't talk to each other as much as we should to work through these things, but you have a very different, even if they are of similar age, they still communicate very mm -hmm. differently, all being very poor in communication. Yeah. Yeah. And Ace Tigris makes a really good point about the fact that he's not of ruling age. If his father dies while he's away from school, like if he's 30, he should just be king. Yeah. But the fact that Claudius takes over indicates to me that he is like maybe 16, 18. Yeah. Is that going to keep me from auditioning to play Hamlet? No. Absolutely not. It's not. <laughs> Nor should it. Nor should it. Um, There have been some really fun performance adaptations of Hamlet. Um, one of my favorite, which kind of piggybacks off of this scene and what I just read from it, like, um, you know, I've been here since uh, our last King Hamlet overcame Fortinbras. That was the day our young Hamlet was born. Um, there's a movie, a silent movie from like the 20s, I think, hmm. with Aston Nielsen. Uh, I might have to look that up in a little bit, but um, she is a silent film star. And hey, Kurt, and they stage this, like, uh, dumb show at the beginning. So this, like, well, I guess it's a silent movie. So uh, they stage this scene at the beginning. And you can see that King Hamlet is fighting for Ambrose. He's in this battle. He's in the war. And Queen Gertrude gets news that he's been killed. And the baby is born at that moment. And so Gertrude decides to tell everyone that it's a boy. So that her... Um, you know, their lineage is safe. So mm -hmm. there's an heir, there's a proper heir. So like Gertrude saves her place. Uh, she saves her child's place. And so young Hamlet is brought up as a boy, but she is not. Mm. And so it's like this like really, really old uh, playing with gender in a way that I think we're only starting to get back around to. Yeah. In, in a justifiable way that was like so brilliant and then that um thank you kurt 1921 was, yeah pretty close yeah um and yeah ace tigress it's like it's such a beautiful like looking at her relationship with ophelia and how that plays out in the film it just like was one of the best hamlet adaptations i had ever seen <laughs> that's really cool <laughs> that's, yeah and it gives like a really good justification for it um and i'm also of the mindset that like you don't have to justify gender because shakespeare is uh, old and dead and gender is irrelevant so like you can do what you want with it but it yeah. was just a really in the night in 1921 for them to be having those conversations yeah that's incredible yeah yeah um it it was really really cool that was the hamlet class that i took in grad school it was just about hamlet which i love do you think I mean, I feel like there is a ton of conversation. If I let me rewind that, if I've learned anything from you. There is a ton of conversation around Shakespeare. Do you think that because of the popularity of Hamlet, it is one that gets more attention and more conversation? I think it's a catch twenty-two. I okay. think that because some of these tragedies, so or some of these plays, so you'll see um, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, even Macbeth a bit. Um, those are kind of the major three. Uh, Midsummer kind of added in. Um, you'll see those couple plays produced more and more and made into more film adaptations. I think because there are more film adaptations, people feel more comfortable producing them and adapting them. And because those are the most commonly taught plays in school, there are more adaptations. And because there are more, more adaptations, people continue to teach them in school. So like, it's this catch 22, this like cycle of like, we're producing this more so we can teach it. We're teaching it because we're producing it. Mm -hmm. nope, it just kind of goes back and forth. Yeah. I would love to see more like big budget Hollywood. And, and this is what Kenneth Branagh did. So for as much as I hate him for what he did to my girl, Emma Thompson, this is <laughs> yeah. what he did best. He took 
Henry V and Much Ado, and he made them in Othello um, with Lawrence Fishburne. He made them blockbuster movies. Like he made Shakespeare a genre of film, and he kind of started the the Hollywood revolution of like making Shakespeare film adaptations. So he really like revitalized the whole genre of it. So like I guess he's fine. <laughs> he's well, okay. Again, much like Shakespeare, with you know, I don't think that he is always really great to his female characters, but he made some really cool stuff. So what a good comparison. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's kind of my thought on like why Shakespeare, why especially Hamlet is so overproduced because like it's the most popular besides Romeo and Juliet, and those are the ones with the most film adaptations, and like people know the best. Like you said, um, the balcony speech is the maybe for you the only one that compares to to be or not to be in terms of like most notable Shakespeare speeches to someone who didn't study Shakespeare. Yeah, and I think that's the because even some of the speeches that we have covered. I think are more captivating, more layered. There's more mm -hmm. to them and it's more exciting. But I think because it's not what's taught, because I had never heard of the Winter's Tale before, you know, it's not one that I'm going to come across or find on my own without specifically being interested in Shakespeare. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's and there's something to be said for Hamlet. And I think that Hamlet is worth more I also think Romeo and Juliet is worth more than the kind of flack it gets a lot of the time. Um, Romeo and Juliet being taught as a freshman English play with teachers who don't really have the same appreciation for it, which is no fault of their own. But like Juliet is not a, a weak dumb dummy. <laughs> Romeo is a is a dumb dummy. Romeo he is a dumb dummy. dummy. He's, he's a, a dumb dummy. Doesn't mean he's not lovable. He's just no. He's he's a dumb dummy exactly and juliet's one of the strongest characters in the canon and i think that if it were embraced and and taught as a comedy for three acts and then a tragedy and you could see the strength of juliet through some of these choices i think that it would resonate with a lot more people same thing as hamlet um i this is what i was saying i've kind of like come around to the realization of of recently um one of the the hallmark complaints against hamlet is that like it's that he doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And that is true. He doesn't really do anything uh, for three <laughs> hours. But he thinks a lot about it. And <laughs> um, Akira Kurosawa's The Bad Sleep Well is, I recommend watching it. It's freaking brilliant. Uh, but it is a loose Hamlet adaptation. And the difference between Hamlet and Bad Sleep Well is that the main Hamlet character throughout, um, we see the we see the the steps that he's taking to lay these traps and make mm -hmm. these plots happen so we see him manipulate this person and we see him kidnap this person to get this information and we see him stage this thing to get a reaction it's all the same steps of that hamlet takes in the play but he says them he has all of the dialogue in the interesting play. in hamlet it all happens in his head and there's a uh, I had a I did a whole, whole P2M episode on this with Alexander Munoz, who is it's so good. That oh episode is so good. I'm sorry, they I are fangirling, but it's no, so good. It is because they are so brilliant and they like totally opened up my brain to this thinking of of Hamlet that like what's more dangerous than someone who you have no idea what's going on in their head? And if you take this like active Hamlet character from Bad Sleep Well, it's all the same stuff that our Hamlet does. But like we don't get to see it, and that's spooky. Yeah, like that's so much power. I love it so much. Me also, too. Oh, and that's the. Oh, it's why. It's why I get so excited with cool adaptation adaptations and mm -hmm. interpretations of material like that. And it's it's finding the little nuggets of things you know about and I, what i always reference because it's what i know better it was a youtube series that was all about pride and prejudice and the way that they had adapted it like some of this stuff that you get to see the way that they did it it pays homage to the original but it does it in this like new and oh i wouldn't have thought about it that way yeah. and if you do it oh it's so good so yeah i love it yeah. yep it's really cool to get to see those, like the way that someone else's brain works with source material and it becomes this like beautiful 
collaboration, um, which is kind of how I feel about your art. <laughs> like when we do these things, because it's seeing, it's showing these um, scenes in such a different way. Like you've got a spooky graveyard. Nope, that's me. I don't want me there. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that's better. Oops, that's um, <laughs> switching to me. So you've got like a nighttime. Yeah. So I'm going to go back through because I don't know if there's. I'm noodling. There's well, this no... is fun. It's, it's an interesting because it is so open. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I want to, how I want to take it. So. Yeah. So I've never seen this scene at night. Really? I've never imagined. Yeah. That's why I just went back to the text to like, see if I was like missing something or if there was something in there. I've that's never so imagined this scene at night, but like, I also understand when I say graveyard and specifically like grave digging. Of time. Yeah. yeah. Like it, <laughs> it makes me think of something where this is a, and I, this is a, I could be completely wrong, but this is where my brain goes, but it's the, because it is, you know, Hamlet's first impression of the grave diggers is one, how could you be this way? And kind of a looking down on someone who has this profession. Mm -hmm. So that's something mm -hmm. that you hide at night. You do your grave digging at night because then that's not something you want to see during the day. During the day, you want to see, you know, the clean, crisp stones, the headstones and the crosses and the mausoleums and stuff. You don't want to see the dirty guys who have to actually do the work. So it feels more like a here's where we hide them. Here's where we put them. And these guys just happen to come upon that and they're like i've never seen this before how could you be so jolly in the moonlight you know digging graves and they're like bro this is what we do yeah and also like the the level of drama that that creates like the tension and like someone alone singing in a spooky nighttime graveyard mm -hmm. that's terrifying yeah but i've never i've just always imagined the scene in daytime because everything that it's staged is uh in the daytime and that's um, such a wild and cool because <laughs> it makes me think of the scene in a whole new in a whole new way and like that's really really fun well, and i think part of it was and it's such a weird but just from a fun how do i want to draw this in a cool way there are such cool like let's see if i can do it without my computer getting mad at me for this pen that i was using <laughs> um like these really like heavy like shadows that come from a character being backlit so like as hamlet is looking on to this character you know they're almost in complete <gasps> silhouette but you get that like rim light which is just the very edge of the character and so it gives them that much more air but to have them be jovial and silly like it's just a fun yeah it's fun lighting like that's that's a fun scene to light because now you can play with all of these deep dark shadows and uh, there's an amazing artist who I know there are many who do it like this, but he's the one who I think of immediately. And his name is Mike Mignola and he's the guy who created Hellboy and he, his sketches are so detailed and intricate, but you look at his final inks and he uses these huge chunks of black ink and heavy shadows. And it just, it works so well and it looks so cool. So, yeah. What you've done in like three lines <laughs> is so evocative and so cool and like that shadow is not even in the shape of like a human it's like you <laughs> no. just drew you just rule a couple, a couple squiggles but like you've created this atmosphere it's just unfair it's not unfair you've worked very hard for this you've done the work but like i want to do this without doing the work <laughs> uh, like that looks so cool and just the the relaxation in his pose yeah, that's what, as you're talking and you're telling me these characters, I was like, no, these are chill guys. They lean on their tools. They're singing. They're they're vibing with each other. And Hamlet is the outsider in this situation. Even though he's royalty, even though he's the main yeah. character, he's the outsider to this scene. They're, he's playing in their domain now. Right. And it um, doesn't help that he is incognito. Oh. He's sneaking back because his uncle tried to kill him. <laughs> and then, <laughs> as you know. You do. Pirates got in the way, which Shakespeare, <laughs> why, why you tease us with pirates and then <laughs> and don't actually let us see the pirates. <laughs> it's like Hamlet comes back. He's like, Hey, this is what happened. 
Uh, I think it's even in a letter. It's not even like Hamlet saying it. It's in a letter to to Horatio. And he's like, wow, yeah, found this letter that said I was supposed to die. And I put it on Rosencrantz and Guildenstern instead. Sorry, guys. Then also pirates came and I jumped on their boat. <laughs> you don't think we want to see that? <laughs> I <wanna> Shakespeare? See <laughs> I want to see that. Now, do you think that's a very constrained by the time where he physically knew that there was no way they could stage it, so he just hide it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely like the same reason like a lot of the um a lot of the deaths are done off stage. Um, it's numbers, it's people. There are already so many characters in Hamlet, like to add three pirates or whatever, right coming into a scene with a bunch of soldiers, and then like, you know, you've got to worry about your your ensemble changing. <laughs> um yeah in those times and so i get it i understand like also if i were doing <laughs> a movie i would like to show the heck out of that yeah <laughs> okay yeah this is fun i have thoughts so i now i have to I, yeah. i've got the the visual in mind i just have to like finalize the details so i can start it looks so cool mm -hmm. like it just looks i know we talked and like the gosh the very very first one of these maybe the second about that kind of big top landscape panel mm -hmm. uh, but it's such a cool way to set mood yeah like and i know it's setting as well but like it gives such a good um indication of mood and there are so many places the thing that stands out to me about what you've got right there is there are so many places to hide Mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's so many especially like knowing Horatio and Hamlet kind of creep in and and they're hanging out trying to stay low um there's so much opportunity for staging like if that were my stage I'd be like oh yeah <laughs> it's so much to work with it's very cool yeah I'm excited and the like classic uh mausoleum style gotta gotta have the big like big building at one point yeah it's not super cool i love <laughs> hamlet i love this play um we are doing it in austin in the fall cool uh, at the yeah the outdoor replica globe so the thing that i love about hamlet is that like i'm definitely going to audition um but there's no there's no bad role in hamlet <laughs> that's <laughs> like, impressive like you you think about the options and there's something really, really striking about every single role in this cast. Because, like, obviously, if you're Hamlet, it speaks for itself. Um, but if you are Ophelia, like, yes, your lines are fewer, but the impact that you have in every scene you're in and that journey of, like, losing faculty and, like, that, like, when she's passing out flowers and singing and, like, after her, like, it is... It can be one of the most haunting Shakespeare scenes ever. Um, if you're Laertes, Ophelia's brother, in this graveyard scene as we come, like he and Hamlet literally jump into a grave and start wrestling about how who loved Ophelia more. <laughs> His like level of spice and and anger and like just pent up energy is so freaking cool. Um, it, you're Gertrude, okay? You have to deal with your your own grief trying to save your own status by getting married to your husband's brother. Do you love him? You get to make that choice. Does she know that he murdered Hamlet? You have so many choices you get to make. The end of the play, does she know that the wine is poisoned when she drinks it to save Hamlet from drinking it? Like, does she know all of these things? You get to decide. Um, if you are, if you're Claudius, you get to have that journey of like, the whole country loves you, but you're a murderer. So, like, balancing that charm with, like, cold-blooded villain? Okay. Um, Rosencrantz Krantz and Guildenstern, the comedy refresher of the whole play. If you're <laughs> Horatio, the best character, the most good, the, the most good character in all of Shakespeare with a heart of whatever is better than gold? Okay. <laughs> and then if you're, like, on the ensemble tracks... the <laughs> i'm like the players that come in and do the mousetrap play you've got these uh ambassadors that are like our country is like 
we're we got some trouble going on. And then you've got all of these like the gravedigger opportunities and uh, Osric at the end, who's just like who Hamlet messes with. He's like, put on your hat, take on your hat, put on your hat, take on your hat. Like, I I truly truly think, and I think this way about most of the plays, but like I truly think that there is no like dis you can't be disappointed if you audition for hamlet and get cast in it at all how could you be disappointed i don't That's know very cool it's just such a good it's such a good play for that reason because even the minor characters don't have minor like impact yeah yeah, platinum. Horatio is the platinum <laughs> character in all of Shakespeare. Thanks, Kurt. I was gonna say, if we're going by D and D standards, I think it's platinum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all I could think of. I wouldn't know because Anthony never gives us any money. <laughs> <laughs> Let us buy stuff, Anthony. I mean, I love the. Uh, he's like, yeah, you go into the shop. Here's all this cool stuff. Can't afford any of it, but it's there. Yeah, here's all this rad stuff that you'll never be able to buy. <laughs> I do like that um he's done the like uh randomized randomized store inventory yes. cuz like that's a pretty cool pretty cool way to do it but also give us more money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me have the things. Please, please let me have the things. Yeah. Um speaking of D&D, &D, if you're all our fans, I don't know what we have for like promo stuff for it yet. Um but Swan and I are going to be playing D and D soon, <laughs> so keep your eyes peeled. Um, it's Tuesday, March eighth, and that's all I got for you. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be good. Yeah, yeah. Keep um keep an eye on our twitters because we will push the heck of it heck out of it once we get some like promo materials. But it's gonna be really really fun. Yeah, I'm I'm super super excited. What, what layer did I drop that on? Who knows. So I'm going to, Ace Tiger says there are no small acting parts, only small actors. I'm going to temper this with agree that there are no small parts and that it's not always the actor's fault if they're disappointed by smaller parts because um, it is up to, to me, it is up to the director to find the good in every single part every single ensemble track, every single part in the play or in the musical or whatever it is, it is so important for directors to appreciate themselves, to appreciate the, sm the smaller parts or the ensemble parts, and to make each actor feel like they are an integral part of the play. Because I have been cast in things with directors who treat smaller parts like they don't matter. And it is very hard as an actor, even with very like little ego, to be excited about that. Yeah. Because when your director doesn't really think you're important, it's hard to want to do something. And so if that's the kind of director, and I see it a lot in like educational theater, I see it a lot in community theater, that people are just kind of like, oh yeah, you're in the ensemble and like we'll get to you later. And that kind of that kind of directing just breeds disappointment because then even if you're in a different program and you get an ensemble slot you've been taught to be disappointed in that because you've been taught that you're not important mm -hmm. and so i agree that a lot of the times it's ego <laughs> a lot of times it's people who you know just want all the lines rather than what's maybe right for them um but i do think directors have really the most important job to make sure people aren't um cast aside in any way yeah i see it too in in dance mm -hmm. um because you have you know you have your principal dancers but you still have a lot of dancers who end up in the core and you need them you can't have these beautiful dances in swan lake without having a whole you know snowflakes and fairies and all of these other swans like you need them and they're important and their dances are beautiful that's the to hype it up that the only valuable role is the one of the main character i wouldn't want to just watch two hours of ballet with just one dancer or two right. dancers like i'm sure they would do a gorgeous job it's not against them it's i'm gonna get bored and they're gonna get really tired <laughs> like, yeah. right and and like kurt says 
Um, one of the shows I had most fun on stage with was a side character. He was written over the top, but still minimal lines. And sometimes, like, that's <laughs> that's so much more fun because there's so much less pressure in terms of, like, memorization. Um, there's so much less pressure in terms of, like, stamina. I mean, when I... <laughs> I was so I playing puck was one of the best things I ever got to do. Um, oh, oh my gosh, Kurt. Sorry, he just said it was Uncle Teddy from Arsenic and Old Lace. Oh, so this is one of uh, I directed Arsenic and Old Lace um, a bunch of years ago, and our friend Lever Number One, who jumps into in ADD, was Uncle Teddy, and he's like a uh, he's like a Teddy. He thinks he's Teddy Roosevelt or like he acts like Teddy Roosevelt or whatever it is. I don't know. Kurt, remind me because it's been a long time, <laughs> but it is the funniest. Like he comes down the stairs with like a trumpet or whatever the hell, like so funny. And that steals the show. Oh well, yeah. He thinks he's Teddy Roosevelt. Thank you. Um, <laughs> like that to then just sit backstage for the first like hour and the last hour, like sit and read a book, do whatever you want, get into character, hang out, watch the show. Like there's so much to be said for those minor characters that like also have massive, massive impact on like the comedy value. Um, when I played Puck this fall, I was exhausted. <laughs> and like, it is a challenge that I loved and would gladly do again and again and again, times a million. Um, but holy bananas, I was like sweating buckets. I was hoarse. I was like, my heart rate was like, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> is this exercise? <laughs> <laughs> and so it was like, it was, I mean, I wasn't off stage for more than four minutes in the second half of the play. <sighs> so like having to be on for that amount of time, super exhausting and super rewarding and super fun. But would I have been happy to do less than that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's just about what the show is and what's right for you and and knowing yourself um, as well as you can. Because, like, we're not all Christines in Phantom of the Opera. Nope. Like, I'm certainly not. I'm that, I'm that, like, jealous dancer who is, like, uh... Nah, my mom runs this. So I'm probably in here because of nepotism, <laughs> but like, you really shouldn't be dating a. You shouldn't be dating a ghost who's kind of creepy through your mirror. That's me. Oh God, tell you it's what, not though, even me because I'm not a ballerina, but whatever. <laughs> no, but well, and she's she's pretty good, but she's both like I feel like her dance part is secondary to her drama part, but also I like it when they play her as the like Christine bro, like, what are you doing? Like, here's a very clear list of things that are really messed up about what's happening right now. Why am I the voice of reason? Yeah. Like, what's <laughs> Why going Why don't you on? understand this? Like, this is, no, this is where weird. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's funny. It's a two-part. So the, the studio that I dance at for a long, long time now, whenever you get to be a senior in high school, you usually are given one of the lead roles in whatever mm -hmm. story ballet we do that year. And, and I remember coming back from college and looking back on how things had changed and people being very disappointed if they were not cast as the lead ballerina role. And a lot of it is because the director is very smart and not only creates and choreographs dances to fit the people that she has, she also casts people based on skill level and where they will shine because yeah. it's your moment to shine. And that's one, it's not something you're going to find at every studio, but uh, the show that we did for my senior year was Camelot, which, boy, if you want to put in the lusty month of May to a whole bunch of high schoolers, you're I don't. brave. You're a <laughs> I brave sure lady. Um, but you've got Guinevere as a main role. It would have been a very different show had you cast me as Guinevere because I was not a prima ballerina. I've never been. I hated point. I wasn't good at it. I've got bad feet. But you know what role was really great for me and I had a friggin' blast with? the jester because that makes sense and i you know i danced in jazz shoes and a lot of the stuff i did wasn't ballet but i got to interact with arthur and guinevere and lancelot and yes. be mischievous in all of these scenes and i had so much fun and so it broke my heart that some of these great dancers who are not ballerinas i was like just because you're not the main ballet role doesn't mean you can 
that you're not going to be able to bring something amazing and memorable to this role. Like people yes. would talk to me about that role that I did, not because I was a main character. Yes. And like your comfort level, instead of like trying to stretch, if I'm trying to play a soprano role, I'm going to be nervous. I mean, and I like, there is a, uh, when I did um, Cats, they had me, they cast me as like the soprano cat, the opera cat or whatever. <laughs> And like it was stupid casting. It was stupid cat. Like I will say that outright. Like I did what I could with it. Um, <laughs> but like I spent the whole show nervous about hitting the notes that I needed to, and I didn't have fun with it. Yep. Like it's not a. You don't want to be worried about how well you're gonna do. You want it to be something that you can just own. And yeah, that's one of the things that I think is great about Shakespeare is that I do truly think that. There are characters that, you know, some people kind of lean towards, gravitate towards, um, some for others. But, like, I truly think that type is irrelevant in Shakespeare. And who you cast becomes what the show is. And, like, the show can take on a style of its own based on whoever you put in these roles. As long as they're, they work together and you trust your actors, like, you can really, like, go kind of balls to the wall with casting in a really yeah. fun way. Hamlet looks spooked. Is that Hamlet? It is. It looks so okay. spooked. So <laughs> this is my idea. And uh, we'll see if it works in my brain the way I think it will. <laughs> uh, so what I was thinking, because, because he's incognito, because we're setting it at night and it's this whole thing, I have this idea of him being like one of the cemetery goths. Like like because he's so drama and he's so exaggerated and all i can picture is noel fielding from the it crowd in his full goth makeup and like so that's what i want that's what i want for hamlet in this like i will never rest until i see noel fielding <laughs> as hamlet yeah so yeah it just swan <laughs> swan I love him. So he's going to have, yeah. So he's going to be just, and it fits. It fits with my whole, like, uh, like when I was first doing the so scene, I was like, good. it's got to be goth. We've got to do like straight up cemetery goth. And yeah. It's, it is incredible. Um, It is the most amazing Hamlet I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. Uh, I take it back. Aston Nielsen, 1921. Silent <laughs> adaptation. Noel Fielding as Hamlet uh, <laughs> is the best. I would watch um, it so much. I would watch, yeah, I would watch the heck out of that because he would be able to, mm, because that's the thing that I love about David Tennant so much as Hamlet is that his ability to be goofy, like when he's acting mad or whatever, like it's so natural. And I feel like Noel Fielding would be even better at that. Yes. Like he would just make you think like, because sometimes I watch Bake Off and I'm like, is it, is this uh, like on for you or is this just you? Yeah. <laughs> just you i think it's just him like some of the ways he interacts with the contestants like i just it has endeared me to him even more from already enjoying him and all his weird stuff i was like i kind of just want to hang out with you <laughs> yeah honestly that's how i feel as well oh my gosh i love it so i'm gonna take a real fast break yep um and then you want to talk about some magic when i come back yeah let's do it Woo, let's do it Oh my gosh. VO by Kurt. Yes. I love the big fat quiz show, especially with Noel and Richard Idawade. Like, mm, it's so good. It's so good. They are so good together. Ah, I love it. I love it. Jeez, watch. I can always goth makeup. It's just, ah. Uh, him in the IT crowd was so good. I just need this this drama of him. <laughs> oh, yes, I, Kurt. I remember you talking about Burgermeister, and it was one of those where I was like, "No, I just feel like you would rock that and bring bring so much to it." Yeah. Yep. Gotta start changing the narrative on, you know the ensemble characters and how you don't have to be the lead in order to make it fun. Okay. 
excuses. How do hands work? There we go. I feel like this one, uh, in comparison to many of the other sketching Shakespeare's that we've done, this one I'm doing a lot more preliminary work before I lay down all of my panels. I'm drawing, I'm sketching out certain bits first, but okay. I'll write in these little floofy sleeves and his crushed velvet jacket. All right, ladies, gentlemen, and friends beyond the binary, are you ready for Protest Too Much, a Shakespeare Showdown podcast where a guest and I go head to head on, I forget what my introduction thing says, but I've been... that's pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, everybody. Uh, we are live at twitch.tv slash a swan named Emily. You can join us on the usually third or fourth Sunday of every month where we do sketching Shakespeare. Uh, I give Shakespeare a Shakespeare. I give, wow. <laughs> I, I give that. Swan a Shakespeare scene. <laughs> and she draws it into a comic panel. <laughs> you can tell like it is clearly Sunday and I'm clearly not ready to go back to work tomorrow. Mm -mm. So we are here live. We are going to, um, we've been drawing the Gravedigger seam from Hamlet. I say we, but Swan has been drawing it and I've been <laughs> giving all my hot takes on Hamlet for the last hour or so. Um, and we're going to transition into a bit of, a bit of magic, a bit of uh, mystery, a bit of excitement. This is our Shakespeare magic bracket. So Yay. we've been in our season of magic and I wanted to kind of talk about like the best power in all of Shakespeare, like the best single magic power in all of Shakespeare. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how to do it, but then um, there is a soccer podcast called Moon Tower Soccer that graciously has allowed Mike and I to steamroll them. And <laughs> our spinoff show Swoon Tower did a smile bracket. For all of the sweet, handsome boys of Austin FC, uh, we we did a bracket about their smiles and who has the best <laughs> one. <laughs> I love it so much. <laughs> so it gave me the idea to do this challenge bracket style or this episode bracket style. And Swan uh, has been gracious enough to play along and give me her hot takes on magic. Swan, why don't you tell everyone why you're just the very best yeah <laughs> well, that's a that's a hard intro but uh I, thank you so much for inviting me i love your show <laughs> it's super super fun so i'm very excited i'm also excited because i can bring my completely limited knowledge of shakespeare onto the show but uh yeah so you say you say limited but <laughs> y'all she has interpreted hamlet as uh noel fielding uh in the gravedigger speech and if you could see my screen right now like her knowledge of shakespeare is whether she knows it or not, extensive. <laughs> I'm learning. It's been fun. It's been very <laughs> fun to learn. And it is it is by far the most enjoyable way to, to learn about Shakespeare, where I get to draw while we're doing it. So I fully support this. But yeah, I, I'm an artist across the internet. I'm a swan named Emily everywhere. And I also have the pleasure of being on a chat show podcast with the lovely P2M pod, aka Steph. So yeah. Yeah, we uh, we're live every other Wednesday night. So if you like our faces based on our if you like our voices, <laughs> you might like our faces. And if you like our faces, come watch us live. I don't know. I've lost. I've lost it. Um, so we're talking magic. Swan, if you you know how people ask you, like, um, if you could have a magical power, what would it be? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer for that? Mm -hmm. <sighs> I go back and forth. I okay. go back and forth um, because <laughs> I love something that is as open-ended as uh, we'll say like Scarlet Witch, which is the prob power of oh. probability and like hex magic and that kind of, because then it can be whatever I want. But also, 
you know, something as lame as time manipulation because there's just not enough time to get everything done. <laughs> so if I could just slow time down a little bit to do more of the stuff I need to do, like it's so lame, but I'm like, man, if I could just pause things so I can have an hour to do my dishes, my laundry, like that'd be really great. And then pick back up and have not missed anything. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I fear that if I had that power, I would waste it. <laughs> I would use those extra hours to like watch more Top Chef. <laughs> um, that's a that's a good one though. I think my usually my answer for this is um, to uh, understand and speak all languages, mm. so that I could learn. Like I could converse with anyone all around the world and understand anything all around the world like if i could be like a human translator that would be my ideal be very cool ideal power we've got a uh, raging lady boner in chat says isabella's power from encanto definitely <laughs> i i could use as i look at like my little plant shelf right now <laughs> and they're all they're all dying <laughs> we try so hard we got a little grow light but <laughs> I would take Isabella's power. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> just want to, I just want to keep plants alive. It's not even like grow them at will. It's just like keep them alive for more than two months. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Anyone has any gardening tips? Um, <laughs> yeah, chat, let us know your, let us know your dream magical powers. And as we go through this bracket, if you have strong thoughts and opinions on the magical powers that we're talking about, go ahead and cast your votes because they may, um, if Swan truly can't decide. We may look help. to chat for some help. Um, so as a note, as a disclaimer, uh, I've boiled down these characters into the like most common power that they use on stage in the play. Okay. So some of y'all might yell at me because I <laughs> have really like really boiled them down to not uh, maybe some unflattering uh, powers based on like your perception of the character and how powerful the character might be in your mind. But just keep in mind, it's what they do on stage. Um, so I'm going to start with one that I think is the one that's going to be pretty controversial. And that is our girl Titania from a Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. Now, <sighs> Titania doesn't do much. She Ooh. doesn't really do any magic like straightforward and of course it depends on your staging and your interpretation um she might put bottom to sleep she might like have like powers of like invisibility manipulation stuff like that um but the thing that is the most kind of uh addressed in her character is that she her emotions or her um encounters are able to manipulate the weather so that's what I've kind of, because she has that whole speech that we did on Sketching Shakespeare a few months yeah. ago, um, about how because she and Oberon are fighting, all of the seasons have altered. It's winter where it should be summer, and the the fog is so dense that it's, you know, swelling rivers over. So, like, this is, to me, a non-purposeful but emotional manipulation of the elements. So that's, yeah. that's power one. So this is our first, let me um throw our... Let's throw our bracket up on the stream. There we go. Um, so our first matchup is between Titania. And then another one that we've done on this stream, Ariel. So, ooh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was Going right for it. Okay. Right? So, Swan, you have drawn um, fireballs being thrown onto a ship and a tempest being created. Yeah. Um, that, that so is manipulating the elements is to me the root of Ariel's powers. So, you know, they can um, create fire and create a storm and then also like um, have this ship that's being tossed around in this tempest not harmed in any way. Um, so manipulating the elements very, very specifically and carefully so that um, only the desired outcome is achieved. So between Ariel and Titania, we have two kind of sim similar powers. One is maybe um, more emotionally 
manipulated. One is more um, purposefully manipulated, but they both kind of like deal with elements and nature and the weather. Yeah. No, I like that. That's a good matchup. I think, I think for me, am I, what I limitedly know, uh, I think I'm going to go for Ariel because it is, while I think there is an emotional component to their actions and everything. And this was mm -hmm. what I thought was especially cool about the episode we did is because I only got the nugget of the play of this, we'll say quote unquote attack. I didn't know that the history behind it and what actually motivated you to that point. So it feels very intense and very scary, but knowing that nobody gets hurt and it is for a specific purpose, that feels like a level of control that Titania doesn't demonstrate. Not that she doesn't yeah. have, but that she doesn't demonstrate. Yes. And that's, I think that that's hitting the nail on the head that I wanted to get across is that I'm not like, because I think Titania is incredible and like has a wild, beautiful, wonderful power, but it's what's demonstrated in the course of the play. Um, all right. So first pick on Ariel. Now, <laughs> Um, our next matchup makes me giggle a little bit. Um, <laughs> first up, we have Puck. And this is the power that I have, besides the power of chaos, <laughs> which <laughs> we all know that anyone can have. Um, the most singular power that Puck demonstrates in the play is being able to run around the entire globe in 40 minutes. Ooh. I'll put a girdle around the earth, round about the earth in 40 minutes, Puck says. So that is like super speed mm -hmm. to me because everything else Puck does in the play is just actions that Oberon told them to do or um, just using the flower. And to me, the flower already has this magical property. So squeezing that on Demetrius and Lysander's eyes like doesn't do active magic himself mm -hmm. so I'm going with the girdle round about the earth in 40 minutes super speed puck is the flash <laughs> Although, way slower than the flash the flash could go around the earth in less than 40 <laughs> minutes but whatever we'll leave it um <laughs> and then puck is up against Prospero oh <laughs> Which, Which, having no very little information about, I know that this podcast does not stand Prospero. I've learned <laughs> he is not a favorite. So, okay, but I'm ready. <laughs> so, there. This is probably when I'm going to get in the most trouble. Um, and like trouble. I don't know, listeners. If you <laughs> if you want to yell at me, just yell at me on Twitter. It's fine. Um. Prospero just tells Ariel to do a lot. Prospero tells Ariel to make the Tempest. Prospero tells Ariel to create this like wedding pageant. Prospero tells Ariel to get the people all across the island. The one thing that Prospero does himself is he puts his daughter to sleep. He's like, go to bed. And she falls asleep. So, you know, a worthwhile power in its own. If I could tell myself to go to sleep and just fall asleep. <laughs> my life would be so much easier like if that were like if you could do that to yourself as well so we're gonna imagine that it's like a a full spectrum sleep spell um okay. so puck super speed prospero go to night uh i'm going puck because i feel like the the usefulness for that power is is a lot more utility there's a lot more you could do with that you could travel the world. Like you could go, you could go see things. You could go like, I could be like, I want to go to London and I could just like jog there in like 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> so I agree. I agree with your choices so far. Um, <laughs> uh, the next round for that puck versus Ariel is going to be very, very difficult. <laughs> there it is. There All right. Is. Now our next round, we have two very similar, um, the same thing as, as Titania and Ariel, two very similar, powers but used in um different ways so the first one we have is the witches from Macbeth, who Ooh, have the okay. power of prophecy their prophecy is very um it's not vague because they're like um no one except Macduff can hurt you and be you only have to worry when the woods come to your house and also you're going to be king and this and that so like they're pretty specific um, but they don't necessarily give a 
sense of direction for how to achieve those things, right? They just say what's up. And then we've got the soothsayer from Julius Caesar, who has one line, <laughs> beware the Ides of March. It's more advice, I guess, really, than like prophecy, but it's very specific. Like he gives the date. He gives like, uh, he's like, you know, stay home on March 15th or whatever. <laughs> so do you go with being able to see many different things in a kind of vague, um, timeless way? Or do you go with something that's like also vague and what that means? What do you mean beware? But like gives you a lot more locked down time frame of, of when that thing is going to happen. I think that the prophecy of the witches telling you who to be aware of allows you to be on guard and making plans and machinations throughout. Whereas it's a, I feel like the existential dread leading up to the Ides of March is going to drive you crazy. It's this one day, like if you were told what day you were going to die, you're going to be insane until that point. And as it gets closer, you're going to become more unraveled. So I feel like even though the witches are giving it a more open-ended explanation or just putting it out there to you, like he's the one, he's the one who's going to hurt you. We're not telling you how, because perhaps if you, okay, so you take over and disrupt his armies or something like that. Okay. But now, now he becomes the underdog and then he's going to rise up against uh -huh. you in a different way. So it's a continuing to be on guard because it's not just one attack, but it could be, this is the person who will, will cause your downfall. So I'm going to go witches. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. For me, I would probably have said the soothsayer because time is the time is the thing for me. If you tell me, if you don't tell me when something's going to happen, I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> and I think you're coming at this from like a more logical <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Which is never something that gets said about me. So <laughs> no, but you are because you're like, you know, like you can lay those seeds and you can make that like those moves and stuff. Me, I'm like, tell me it's gonna be Tuesday. I see a calendar <laughs> invite for a meeting with my boss. And I'm like, I only have 12 more hours to throw up every second because I'm so nervous about this thing that I don't know what it's about. So like, at least there's an end time to it. <laughs> oh gosh. So Whereas I, I feel like it's the, if I have a meeting set with my boss, I am going to be panicked every moment until that thinking I'm going to get fired. Whereas like, you will have a conflict for your boss. We're like, okay, I could look for another job. I could buff up my resume. I could do all these other things because they're proactive and they'll keep me busy. So I don't go crazy. <laughs> you're right. No, you're, you are absolutely right. That's, that's smart. Um, okay. And our last, our last first round matchup, this one's going to be spicy as well. <laughs> this is between Joan of Arc who summons fiends to help her on the battlefield. Now, Ooh. Uh, the word fiend is used. The word spirit is used. Uh, she basically summons some like ghosties, uh, that come out and then they don't actually help her. They're like, nah, Joan, you're on your own. Sorry. Oh. But like the fact that she can summon like a, an army of like spirits is pretty bamf. She's pretty cool. And then we've got Oberon who again, might be controversial. Uh, depending on whether you think he has power over this, like, love flower, or if you think that, like, Cupid aimed his bow, shot it down, <laughs> flower became magical, and Oberon just squeezed it in people's eyes, his only magic power is invisibility. Mm. Like, he says, I am invisible! And then he's <laughs> invisible. Um, <laughs> which always makes me laugh, because I think it's funny. I know it's because it's on stage, and obviously people can't become invisible, but, like, I... I'm invisible and will overhear their conference. Like, okay, we get it. Um, <laughs> so uh, invisibility just... or some summoning unhelpful fiends. <laughs> okay, so clarifying question for, for the mm -hmm. unhelpful fiends. Are they witnessed by anybody else? Do oh. they make it to the battle with her? Do they, inter like, not necessarily interact, but... Does it is it seen by anybody else? That's a great question. Um, I th she sees them. They come onto the battlefield. She's mid fighting. I don't think anyone else sees them. 
Okay. Um. <laughs> Cause that de that's definitely gonna influence my my decision. Let me let me check. Um. Y'all are seeing like a real time. Uh. <laughs> protest too much episode where i just cut all of this um <laughs> googling that i do why can't i <laughs> cutting hero why can't i find this i mean he picked a good time when we were already gonna cut it so it's true it's true <laughs> um uh, someone in chat help me out someone be smarter than i am okay i've given myself so many layers now <laughs> i don't even know <laughs> there's so many there's so much going on okay there's that let's see we're gonna combine you there okay enter okay okay so it's an act five scene three um uh, the regent conquers and the Frenchman fly. Now help you charming spells and periops and you choice spirits that admonish me and give me signs of future accidents. Thunder, you speedy helpers that are substitutes under the lordly monarch of the north appear and aid me in this enterprise. Enter fiends. Uh, the speedy and quick appearance argues proof of your accustomed, accustomed diligence to me. Now you familiar spirits that are culled out of the powerful regions under earth. Help me this once that France may get the field. They walk and speak not. These are the... These are the <laughs> These are the stage directions for the fiends. Uh, they walk and speak not. They hang their heads. They shake their heads. They depart. <laughs> oh. So they're just like, nah. Um, she is on stage alone. Okay. Um, she is, yeah, she is on stage alone. Doesn't have an, it doesn't have an entrance for uh richard coming after that oh no 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 okay so uh gloucester says damsel of france i think i have you fast unchain your spirits now with spelling charms and try if they can to gain your liberty a goodly prize fit for the devil's grace see how the ugly wench doth bend her brows as if with circe she would change my shape so i think i think that's up for interpretation because okay. they do leave um they do leave before she comes back in with before she comes back in fighting richard okay or fighting york i mean okay so i'm gonna go i'm gonna kind of distill this down into we'll say D D because that makes sense to my brain mm -hmm. in that so if she was casting if she was actually casting a spell to try and affect others it's not that and it's not effective but then if if she was trying to cast a spell that was going to be a buff to herself to inspire something i don't think that works either because she she tries to get you know call aid and they're like nah so i think in these two for the effectiveness of it i hate to do it but i think it goes to oberon because while he does announce what he's doing you know, <laughs> that, and then turns into you know turns invisible <laughs> bat. Bat. Uh, uh yeah i think his is actually for spell casting, he his is effective. He rolled well, and uh, Joan did not. Joan does not. She does she's not roll not, well. She's not roll uh, well. Which she's such a great character, and there was a lot of scholarship on like, wow, Shakespeare did Joan dirty, <laughs> which I agree with. Um, <laughs> so I feel like I should have uh, maybe stacked these, stacked this uh, bracket a little bit more differently, a little bit more spaced out. <laughs> but we've got the tough conversation of Ariel and Puck right now. Oh, okay. Ariel versus Puck. So do you want to uh, be able to manipulate the elements or do you want super speed? It's kind of what we've boiled them down to. Okay. So uh, I think if we're going again, and I'm, I've distilled everything down into X-Men. So I'm thinking <laughs> if you have speedster versus weather, you can immediately create any sort of tornado or hurricane that lifts your speedster off the ground and their power is kind of negated now i know if you're a flash fan in some of it he can <laughs> spin his arms really fast and make his own <laughs> tornado it's don't come at me there's a lot of, there's a lot 
but I think versatility, I think I'm going to go aerial. I think it's just, there's more, <laughs> there's more there. Yeah, I think that what's really interesting about this is that you're taking these characters and I'm kind of boiling them down really out of context of their plays. <laughs> um, so it's an, a really interesting kind of uh, view into this. We've got Bread2287 says Puck uh, in the chat definitively. Um, sorry. Sorry, it's <laughs> Ariel now. Sorry, Bread. I think that I think I would probably agree with you that I would take Ariel's powers uh, just because they're so much more comprehensive than pucks tend to be. But witches versus Oberon. Do you want the power of prophecy? Do you want to know what's coming? Do you want to know where you're going to end up? Are you going to be king? You you would know. Or do you want to do you want bat? become invisible? <laughs> bat. That's just, I'm sorry. That's how I'm going to think of Oberon from now on. It's just him yelling, <laughs> him yelling bat and just turning invisible. It's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go witches. Again, Where, for, really? I am for utility. Uh, it's the, yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a limit. I think there's a very specific limit to what, Oberon can do and and again this is the fun of it of me not knowing these characters so in depth knowing them on this surface level yeah. also I'm just thinking of that of the scene that we did with Oberon and he was being kind of a jerk face <laughs> and yeah so I see him I don't trust him with his invisibility let's say that I think sure. he's going to cause more trouble than good and I think that <laughs> while the witches are vague uh you know I'm going to yeah. say that they you could keep coming back to them and getting different things. Whereas with Oberon, you're going to get the same thing each time. That is true. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a good justification. <laughs> um, some notes in chat. Uh, we've got future sight for the witches, which is kind of the D and D spell counterpart. Um, <laughs> and then I'd love invisibility, but would love to get some sleep. Oh, Vineyard warrior. I <laughs> hear you. And same. Uh, that's, that would be the Prospero, like the only thing for Prospero for me, but it's not enough. It's not enough to choose him outright. Uh, <laughs> we're on our final round. Um, yeah, there are so with all of the like, I, I didn't count gods and goddesses, even though some appear on stage in the plays. Um, I didn't count them in this because I wanted them to be like uh, human ish characters that kind of had direct powers. So out of all the magic in Shakespeare, we are down to Ariel versus the witches from Macbeth. <laughs> Swan, mm. this is a tough one. This do is a want, tough one. Do you want prophecy or do you want the ability to manipulate uh, all of the elements? <sighs> Brett says the witches are great at parties. <laughs> 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 they're coming in with that punch. They've got, <laughs> they're going to get everyone drunk and tell them their futures. Okay, so I guess I want a little bit of a clarifying question because I know while the witches all work together cooperatively uh how is ariel once he is no longer under the sway of prospero we don't know okay because the very end of the play is prospero setting ariel free finally <laughs> <laughs> so we don't really know i would like to believe my inter my ariel <laughs> mm -hmm. uh is a sweet pure innocent angel okay i don't know if that's everyone's ariel but that's <laughs> what i would like to believe uh, it's really actually funny that we came down to these two because um the episode that i did with michelle kelly on who would be the best stage magician michelle brought Ariel and had me argue the witches. So I think this is a really fun that we've kind of gotten back to this, this matchup comes all the way around. Yeah. I like it. Uh, okay. So then given the constraints of the play, which is how I'm going to do this so that I can actually make a decision. Uh huh. I'm going to say the witches because of the complete agency over themselves. Wow. So if you're talking powerful magic that is seen and done, it's they've got they've got the most powerful, they've got the most possibility for causing damage, causing insight, causing 
inspiration. Yeah, and hands off damage too, right? Like we just we just told you what was gonna happen. You didn't have to murder the king. Yeah, like very puppet master. Like that's a that's a level of power that again, without knowing the you know the next step after after the play for Ariel, you don't know. Was was there a an inspiration from Prospero that was pushing him in his powers mm -hmm. farther because he was under sway? Hi, cat. Uh or, you know, was that all his, their own doing? Yeah, I think that's really cool. I am, um, I'm surprised when I built the first, so when we had Titania, Ariel, Puck, Prospero, which is Soothsayer, Joan of Arc, Oberon, I didn't know who was going to win, but I wouldn't have put my money on the witches. And so this is, this is very <laughs> cool. So on, thank you for doing this. Y'all, we're going to do a series of, um, brackets, Yay! um, on twitter so at p2m pod we're going to have like the first couple matchups each day the first round and then we'll wait a couple days have the second round wait a couple days have the third round so make sure that you are following us uh, on twitter so that you if you disagree <laughs> you can make yourself heard um so on thank you so much for doing that with me <laughs> that was so much fun thank you for having me yeah, I really wanted just like that objective opinion of like, I'm going to explain a magical power totally out of context. Uh, you tell me which one's better. <laughs> uh, tell everyone again where they have to go find you and follow you immediately. <laughs> yes, come find me. Uh, follow me across the internet at a swan named Emily. I stream art on Twitch. I also am the founder and leader of the Doodle Crew. So a bunch of artists who get together and create live illustration. Uh, those all, and including sketching Shakespeare, which we're on right now, all end up over on my YouTube. Uh, so follow me there. And if you disagree with my choices, please let me know, uh, as the, the uninformed Shakespeare party in this, but yeah, all over the internet at a swan named Emily and every other Wednesday with Miss Steph herself. Woo. Doodle crew hype, sketching Doodle Shakespeare hype, hype NADD hype, swan hype. Thank yeah. you for doing this. Thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and we'll see you all next week. <laughs> that was cool that was fun that was really fun thank you for thank you for doing that absolutely because <laughs> like i said i really just like i'm into brackets right now yeah and y'all for real if you want to look at some handsome handsome boys <laughs> swoon tower yeah go to moon tower on twitter and um listen to the episode because i think it's funny uh, but also you, you will get to vote in their smile brackets as well. So lots of, lots of fun coming up. Um, how's our boy Hammy doing? He's good. He's good. I'm oh, having, look at him. <laughs> so I have this idea. And again, it's, it's picking on him a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit, but I'm having this moment where he's the only one because he's in disguise he's the only one in extreme costume so you're gonna have horatio just be in like kind of regular clothes and then mm -hmm. like yeah i don't know so he's just standing there he's like i don't know grave digger like he's on the ground he's talking to a skull like we're here now i'm sorry i no, I don't know so but i just i i love this idea of the over the top exaggeration that noel fielding does as the goth so he's having these moments of you know hand to chest looking away like gasping like just mm -hmm. just over the top so i want him in this one we're gonna have him creeping around you know a praying angel statue you're gonna have him falling to the ground looking at the skull and then just you know grave digger just looking at him and be like what what are you doing what do you what do you do down there I can't like get over the level of detail and, and like an expression in these faces because like I can see exactly like what he's feeling. Like all three shots are so, oh my God, they're just so good. <laughs> they're so good. Oh, this is interesting. So I was going to just explain it like we were still on a podcast, but everyone can see what we're doing. <laughs> but okay. talk me through like um, doing a rough sketch in the panel, like just an outline in the panel, and then using a side, um, like side space to draw them bigger and then shrink them down. Like talk, talk me through that because I, I, I feel like I get why, but it, I just didn't expect it. Uh, so I think this is a little bit closer to how I would normally do 
a comic page if we were not live creating it like we do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would take I would take the script that we have and I would thumbnail it out, which is what these little stick figures are. It's just a super simple, let me figure out my placement, like, let me figure out camera angles, let me just figure out how this is all gonna fit together and what I want to feel. And with this one, because once again, I had nailed down the character and the look, sketching those first, because this is what I need to get it out because I need to Hamlet to, to be on my page, but I'm not ready to put that detail into the panels because I don't know how how the page is going to lay out just yet. I don't know the beats. I don't know how everything fits together, how we get to that final reveal the way I want it to. So it's a beauty, a beautiful thing about digital art is because I can have all of these character sketches around it while I'm figuring stuff out and then just pop them in on a new layer of where they go and manipulate them a little bit. And then if I need to redraw, I can. But if not, if the, the way that I did it originally works, then I don't have to do more work. So yeah. <laughs> Part efficiency, part laziness. No, I mean, I just had never seen it, um, like, in, like, live time before. And it's so smart because you can get all of the detail that you want in that bigger sketch and then just shrink it down to fit your box. Because, like, you have to also – yeah, that's – I just had never – that's one of those where, while my personal preference is to always draw traditionally because I just like it, there is a benefit to working digitally because I can go in and I can add as many layers, as many details as I want, and then make it what's going to end up being, if it were to be printed out, you know, an inch and a half tall. Whereas if I were to try and do that minuscule detail, can it be done? Absolutely. Do I have the technical skill to do it because my hand shakes? Absolutely mm. not. So so actually, that's a that's a question that I have is like, how do you how do you change things for that small size? Like, what do you do to make sure that like, it's cause like the really basic uh, analog I have for the analogy I have for this is creating a logo and making sure it still looks good in like uh, the iTunes mm -hmm. tiny box. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you approach knowing that it's going to be so small? Uh, so some of this, and I, I always go back to my background in animation because that's where I learned these specific skills. I'm sure if I had gone into specifically sequential illustration as a college degree, I would have learned it there too, but I didn't cause I didn't know what I was doing. It happens. Uh, but <laughs> the big thing that they taught us in animation is not only should a character be completely recognizable in silhouette, you should be able to get thoughts, feelings, emotions from that silhouette. So it's the, you know, and we've kind of talked about this a little bit before. Let me bring this down a little bit. So, you know, I've got my character here and I have them, you know, hands are on the ground and they're hunched over. So if I were to draw that of them, if you were looking at them straight on, you can see what it is as I'm drawing it. But as soon as I start to add more detail, you lose the arms, you lose the fact that they're hunched. So that silhouette doesn't make any sense. So thinking about the fact that it's going to be smaller, you know, if I have Hamlet holding the skull right in front of him and I shrink it down, unless I really punch the contrast in, you're not going to be able to see that. So in that, okay. as I'm sketching it out, I want not only a dynamic pose, but I want something where you can clearly see his head separation what he's looking at and you get that even if it gets so small that you can't necessarily see all of the details anymore so it's really thinking about what is a readable shape what is a readable silhouette and what does the body language say okay so really just like yeah like it's angles are a lot of it huh mm -hmm. yep yep a lot of angles a lot of <sighs> I'm trying to think of other <laughs> silhouettes, always the big one, but just the, what does your body do when you're feeling a certain way? That's, mm -hmm. that's a huge part of, of the thought process of it. And, you know, why do we automatically think something when we see a character making a certain face? Yeah. So I think it's why you could have, you could have stage actors who were, 
whether they were a good actor or not, you could have them hunched over. You could have them falling dramatically to their bed to be distraught, very Disney princess like. <laughs> whether they're showing it on their face or not, their body language shows it enough. Uh -huh. So if you're far enough away, you know, they could have broken character for a second and been laughing. But as long as you fall to the bed heavy enough, it still reads as what emotion you were feeling or meant. Sure. To feel. And I think that I guess like now I'm now that I'm thinking through it. Um, <gasps> For me, like I have really bad eyesight. Um, I obviously I wear contacts, but um, even with my contacts, my eyesight is not what other people's is. <laughs> um, and so for me, like I was watching the soccer match last night, and I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn who each of the players is because, like, I can't read the numbers a lot of the time. I mm -hmm. definitely can't read their names on the back of the jersey. Um, one of my favorite players has like really bleached hair so i'm like oh, i know where diego is um but reading their body language has been something that i've started to try to get to know them by rather than like other identifying hero people are allowed to live here <laughs> disagrees <laughs> um you know rather than other identifying features that would take good eyesight to see um so i think that's a really interesting it's interesting to think about in art as well as like boiling it down to those distinguishable, that distinguishable body language. Yeah. And I think it's, there's an interesting thing where in so many ways, there's not one right way to create art. There's not of one, one right way to story tell, but I think with animation, with comics, because you're usually on a tight time frame, you're usually on a tight schedule your economy with your line is important. And if you only have a small amount of space to tell the story that you're telling or tell the scene, you want to make sure that every line you put down has a purpose. Like I, I don't need to see three different panels of three different angles of the graveyard unless it's something like, we'll say Batman walking up to his parents' grave. If that's the hit of the scene, sure, you can draw three super detailed different angle shots leading up to that grave, and that's the final hit. But for okay. this, it's not that. For me, for the what I wanted to get out of the scene was this moment of interaction between the grave digger and between Hamlet. And it gives you a little bit of time. So I'm starting to put in like little music notes so you hear that it's happening throughout while Horatio and Hamlet are interacting. And then just in this one scene, you get the person who is singing and their personality through the way that they showed up. And then you get to see how that interacts with the Hamlet character that you've gotten to see a couple panels of. So it was the economy of what's important. What do I need to have in here to tell that story? And what can I let go? And I didn't need three panels of just the graveyard setting. You were going to be able to yeah. figure it out from the first one. And then we can jump to something else. Yeah, so. I think that makes a lot of sense. I never thought about like economy of, of line work in that way that like in the same, it's the same for theater. Like it's how long do we need to tell this story? How long can we spend on this image or this like um, tableau or whatever before we have to move into, you know, really getting the characters out there. Yeah. And it's one of those where it's, it is artist choice. If you are, you know, you will say someone who is making like a web comic where there is, you can tell the story however you want. And you, if you are writing it, you're beholden to only yourself. So you can spend as much time on each one as you want. But that's a personal preference. And then your readers will either enjoy that or not. And so I think to try and hit more people and grab more people with it, I am more of the school of let's get to the point that I really want you to focus on. If you then yeah. go back and enjoy, you know, that I put silly little names on the tombstones. That's great. Wait, did, no, you didn't. Not no. yet. <laughs> but it's something I would definitely do. Yeah. So. And yeah, those, but those, those would become, those are kind of like long game, right? Because exactly. then as you do more and more and more, people are like, oh, there are tombstones in a swan comic. Like I gotta see who is, I gotta see who's on there. Or you do Patreon reward tiers for. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep. And it's the, it's the levels of it that are cool and fun, but it's not the most important thing. Yeah. So yeah. That's really cool. This is like a really, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not trying to punk you with these scenes. <laughs> um, I probably, I want to preface with that. <laughs> I don't think that you are. <laughs> because 
I've like the past couple of weeks, like I am so linear in my thinking. I'm so close minded in the way that like I see Shakespeare. I don't think about modern adaptation. Like I do in some things, like if I'm going to direct it, I'll take the time to think. Right. But like for a lot of stuff, it's not my natural first instinct. Like I naturally see everything in kind of that Elizabethan or that Kenneth Branagh, Jane Austen yep. uh, style of like white flowy dresses and whatever. Yep. <laughs> um, so I've given you a couple of scenes lately that I'm like, I don't know how else to see this. Mostly because like, I'm just, like I said, it's not a punk. I'm just curious to see how you think it, like how you see it and like what you can take from it. Cause it's always so much more than what I bring to it. So I don't know. I just think it's, it's cool to have this really kind of modern setting but also have hamlet as a character stand out so severely in someone who is modern and <laughs> ridiculous yes yes no it's it's one of those where and i'm sure there's going to be a scene where where we come to where the we'll say the regency-esque the miscellaneous regency era yeah. is going to fit best just because of how that scene plays but part of the fun is how do we keep this theme, this feeling, these emotions that are trapped in this scene, how do you make them universal? And if you take them out of that, that specific look, how do you transfer that to something that is still as readable? And I mm -hmm. like that challenge. I like that idea of, okay, so this is what my go-to, you know, immediately in my head, this is what I see in my head, but what else does this scene say? What, you know, what would be, oops, uh, you know, what would be your friend's reaction if all of a sudden, you know, you're sneaking through the graveyard, you're trying to do something and your friend just like knelt to the ground and was like, death is a really big deal. Did you know? <laughs> Did you know? Like, uh... like, yeah, I saw your dad's ghost. Okay. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Like, no, I know we're having a thing and it's tough, but we really need to keep moving. Like, uh, okay. Yeah. People have jobs. It's a thing. Like, I just, I, I like that. I, really I like do. the fun of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, and this is a comedy scene while also being really, really, really tragic because, you know, we don't, to me, uh, it's going to get, you know, like a little, a little, uh, morbid, I guess for a minute. Uh, so <laughs> tune out if you need to, but to me, staging uh, I think that you'll probably agree with this in an art sense, and I'm excited to hear your perspective on it. Um, when characters die, it doesn't, their deaths aren't the thing that are sad. It's the other characters' reactions to it yeah. that are the sad part. Like it, when you're staging something, like people know these are actors. Like people know that, you know, it's a play or whatever. Like Ophelia is going to die Saturday through sunday <laughs> friday thursday through sunday whatever yeah. um but when you see hamlet find out that she has died and then you see him fighting through grief with her brother like that's what's sad to me um it's not necessarily the death itself it's how it affects the people who are still alive and i feel that way just kind of in general like uh you know people like pe the people that are still here are the people that uh i feel such a need to like take care of and like to be something for because like that is the most heartbreaking thing in the world to me and uh the most heartbreaking thing that i can like consider is being you know but yeah so I, I imagine it's the same in art with like reactions yeah because i think unless your unless your goal in inspiring emotion in the audience is shock mm -hmm. the actual death of a character now the unexpected nature of it can be a huge part of it that mm -hmm. can be if you were not expecting this to happen that can be very startling and especially if it is a particularly visually intense representation of that i think that is also a lot however i don't think any of that necessarily ties to the character who has perished mm -hmm. And, and it's funny, and I know, I, I feel like this is appropriate, so I'm going to bring it up. Um, when Mufasa 
dies, spoiler, uh, in Lion King, it is very sad. But when you, as the audience and Simba, get to that character, they don't have any lines, they don't have any movement, their story has ended. But the heartbreaking thing about that is the sad music that's playing and the reaction of Simba. I'm getting Dad? chills right now. <laughs> When I, so because I'm a monster, when I staged Macbeth, when Banquo dies, um, so Banquo is, uh, there are murderers and they flee on Banquo's son escapes um, and Banquo dies. And so I had this scene and I staged it where um, the witches sang like a lullaby every time a character died in the play, like mm -hmm. from off stage. Um, so like Banquo dies and they started singing. And then I had like, Fleance, who was like hiding behind something like come back out and do that like mufasa dad kind of thing that kind of mm -hmm. like push and like i'm getting chills about it now but that yeah stole directly from the lion king yeah. sorry disney <laughs> you made a really good scene you, you made you made people cry so oh my god yeah, yeah, so it's, and it, again, just to to tie back into something personal to me, because that's what I do. Uh, when I was younger, the very first story ballet I ever danced in was Lion King. And I played young Simba, who was just can't wait to be King Simba. And it was that scene. And the woman I had to do that scene with, it was just the two of us on stage. And she was my modern teacher and had been my teacher since I was three. And I am... 12 or 13 at this point like i was a middle schooler and so it was it was hard for me to understand in the moment like mm -hmm. how much of this because i was so nervous but it it's this incredibly lonely feeling being on stage by yourself with this person that you respect who's your teacher who's your mentor and you're going through all of this and i'm just like really amazed i made it through that because in the moment all my thought was i have to nail the skater turn and not fall down don't fall down don't fall <laughs> down the skater like, turn uh you stand on one leg and you have the other leg pointed and you spin in a circle with your arms out okay okay yeah okay. <laughs> yep the title matches the tin <laughs> yep so but yeah i just i think of that scene as mufasa isn't well he is the focal point in that he's not the one that is having the emotional thing. It is the people who are left behind who are going through the emotional aspect of that. Yeah. Sorry to get real. <laughs> I, picked this, I picked this scene like a week and a half ago so we could do some promo and whew, <laughs> it's been a week, y'all. It's been a really hard week, I think, for a lot of folks. And I hope you're doing okay. Um, and reach out to us if you need an arm or an ear or I know I'm speaking for you, Swan, but I imagine. Yeah. It's the no. same for you. Um, we love you. And it's been really great to get to do these streams, to get to spend this time with you. Um, I said uh, something like this on Twitter the other day that like being able to escape into podcasts and art and stream and all of that is absolutely a privilege um, because that level of escapism is not available to everyone. It's not an option for a lot of people. And um, we know that a lot of people need it. The people that who can, the people who can take advantage of that need it in these times. And you know, we're here. Uh, and uh, today I, was, I probably should have <laughs> called an audible and changed the scene. Um, <laughs> but uh, just the fact that you're here with us, we're really grateful and we hope you're taking care of yourself and we love you. Someone named Emily all across the internet. <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to cut it after that because there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to be as good as that. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. We love you. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye.